to welcome everyone to the 12th public seminar in the series of Brokering China's Extroversion, or BROKEX, as we call it, at the University of Oslo. My name is Heidi Spahelgen. I do research on contemporary China, and I'm the principal investigator of BROKEX. We want to thank the Research Council of Norway for supporting this series. Today, we will discuss cadres in China, who become cadres in China today, how do they govern, and how are they themselves changed in this process? And to talk about this, we have with us two Norway-based researchers, Dr. Julia Marinaccio and Dr. Yunyun Zhou. They will be introduced by Hedda Flate, a senior researcher at FAFO here in Oslo, who is also chairing our session today. Over to you, Hedda. Thank you very much, Heidi. I am uh, honored to be moderating this seminar, uh, which is, I understand, the last one in the Brokex series. Uh, and I'm also very excited uh, to have the opportunity to learn about the lives of Chinese government employees from these two eminent scholars. So just a, a few words about myself first. Uh, as Heidi mentioned, my name is Hedda. Uh, I work at an independent social science research foundation uh, here in Oslo called FAFO. Um, and I do research on Chinese public opinion related to public goods and environmental protection and the political system. Um, so the speakers here today, uh, Julia Marinaccio and Joe Nguyen, um, they are going to share their insights about those insiders who work for the Chinese political system at the local level. And they have both spent a lot of time in the field getting to know who some of these people are, how the system that they work with influenced them and, and how they shape their own role within the party state. Uh, so they are going to talk about these and, and other questions from two um, kind of distinct perspectives. Uh, first, Julia will talk about her book on environmental officials. Um, uh, she is a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Foreign Languages at the University of Bergen. Uh, and her research explores Chinese environmental governance, ideology and regime politics in mainland China, and also I see Chinese-Taiwan relations. And the book that she's going to talk about today is, is this one uh, called uh, Linking Theory with Practice, Cadre Training and Environmental Governance in China. And this book describes how cadre training functions as a kind of a critical instrument to steer local political action and promote an ideology of sustainability in China. Uh, so let's start by learning about environmental caters. Uh, so Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction and also for inviting me today. Um, I will now share my screen. Just give me one second to prepare the screen for you. Oh, yes. So now you should see it. Okay. So again, thank you to the organizers for, uh, for today for uh, putting this panel together. And I'm really um, looking forward to, uh, to engage in, in a conversation uh, with two knowledgeable women whose work I very much admire. So the book that I'm going to present today is the revised version of my PhD thesis uh, that I wrote at the University of Vienna um, and I uh, finished everything in 2018. Um, and in this book, I analyze, um, had I already mentioned that, how cadre training is employed to bring about the value change in China's development model towards sustainable de development. And today I would like to explain the contribution of my research and why it matters and what and how I have conducted this, uh, like what I have done and how I, I've conducted the research and uh, the main findings. Okay, so. Let's go. Um, so in the early 2000s, China shifted its official rhetoric from economic growth driven development to a development model that also considered or that should consider social equity and environmental soundness. Researchers began to tackle the central government's efforts to increase local government's responsiveness, responsiveness towards these new directives. And studies mainly focused on hierarchical instruments of regulation, supervision, and punishment. In contrast, softer elements of politics, such as information dissemination and knowledge construction, received far less uh, attention. 
and Carter training was one of them. So research is, but uh, there has been research on, on cadre training, obviously, and researchers who have been, uh, who studied cadre training have significantly enhanced our understanding of this aspect of cadre management. But with party building in mind, they remained fixated on party schools and executive leadership academies, leaving technology oriented sector specific training that is provided by specialists uh, specialized line bureaucracies uh, woefully uh, unexplored. So in my study, I pursued to understand the role of training in the Chinese Communist Party's efforts to promote and operationalize its vision of sustainable development. I was specifically interested in how specialist training is organized in line bureaucracies responsible for environmental and natural resource management, how this training connects to conventional cadre training that we know from literature, and to what extent it actually supports officials at the local level in finding solutions for challenges in sustainable development on the ground. So why should we care? Sustainability studies have long pointed to the importance of human capital development. New skills and knowledge need to be developed in order to, for example, deal with environmental degradation that results from growth-driven development strategies. And just the other day, I came across an intriguing news report, a news article about the difficulties of uh, local governments in Jiangxi um, in cleaning up the mess that, is le that was left behind by uh, rare earth mining. And guess what? Their major problems are lack of money, obviously, but also technology, so human capital development. Me uh, from like in terms of methodology, I decided to do a case study on the state forestry administration. First and foremost, the, uh, because the forestry bureaucracy is an example of a line bureaucracy responsible for promoting forests economic and, and ecological functions. And secondly, because forest policy is particularly intriguing due to the major policy shift from resource extraction to resource protection that occurred in 1998. And for this reason, I could trace and analyze how training was deployed to accompany this value change within the uh, bureaucracy over uh, the last 20 years. Uh, for my analysis, I used uh, mainly qualitative, not mainly, I used qualitative uh, research methods by, by gathering a variety of textual uh, material, but also by conducting expert interviews during three rounds of field work in different places in China. The people I interviewed encompassed forestry carters at all levels of the forestry bureaucracy, so from the center to the, uh, to the township. And I also interviewed scholars, Chinese scholars, but also international experts who were involved in forestry cadre training. And finally, to get a more comparative perspective, I, uh, I looked into forestry training in my home country, in Austria, and visited forestry training institutes uh, there as well. Um, and they turned out to be quite good source to make, uh, make up new connections with uh, Chinese forestry officials. Um, that was rather unexpected. Okay, so, whoops, sorry. The main argument of my book is that Carter training is designed to help the CCP maintain its political legitimacy. Uh, though, uh, though presiding over an authoritarian one-party state, uh, one state, in which it does not compete with other parties and their ideologies over popular votes, the party is still dependent on popular uh, support. This is, at least in, in my field, already common knowledge. So far, so good. So to receive the support, this, uh, the party has to deliver. And the CCP's legitimacy hinges on the party state's administrative capacities to transform the words of policy statements into consistent action, or to put it in the terminology that I used in my book, to translate symbolic ideology into operational ideology. In the context of sustainable development, 
This means that the party needs to make sure that the environmental bureaucracies develop the necessary technical know-how to solve problems created by socioeconomic development, such as the cleanup uh, of, the, uh, of former rare earth mines. Both the overall structure and organization of training are designed for this very purpose. Through training, officials should internalize the values and principles of, of the CCP's ideology of sustainability on the one hand, and on the other hand, they should learn and update technical skills and specialist knowledge that they need in their specific work fields. This type of capacity, uh, this type of skills and, and knowledge is not and cannot be conveyed in party schools, but only in training institutions of specialized line departments. And moreover, uh, the, this training must be organized, uh, and this training uh, is organized to serve the party's interest. So as you can see, my book has seven chap chapters, including the introduction and the conclusion, uh, and the, um, uh, the more theoretical part in chapter two, uh, the empirical chapters of chapter three, uh, four, and five. Um, and in this, uh, in this book, um, I, uh, I explain what the multi-layered structure of cadre training looks like. So the connection between party schools or the, uh, and, and, and the uh, uh, training in line bureaucracies, how it came into being, and I dissect how the specific process of knowledge construction is organized and unfolds. So I describe basically how this tool of communicative political steering works. Um, in chapter three, I revisit the history of cadre training, but draw, uh, I draw particular attention to the evolution of forestry training as an integral aspect of cadre training. I demonstrate that the combination of secure knowledge and classical indoctrination is not, as purported in literature, a product of the reform era. On the contrary, the foundation of today's multi-layered structure was already established in the early 1950s. And the modernization of cadre training in party schools went alongside the modernization of specialist, train, uh, specialist cadre training in line bureaucracies. However, as specialist knowledge was weighed differently in different historical periods, the cyclical shifts in the emphasis from operational ideology to symbolic ideology and vice versa occur, uh, occurred over time. And they affected, for example, structural endowments uh, and what kind of training cadres needed to undergo, both in party schools, but also, uh, but also in line bureaucracies and forestry. In chapter four, I unfold how training is organized in the forestry administration and analyze uh, how it uh, how it is um, actually how it is put into practice at the local level. The earlier example of uh, of news of the of, uh, of of the recent news on environmental cleanup in Jiangxi demonstrates clearly that specialist training falls short uh, of its expectations at the local level. Bureaucratic fragmentation and resource constraints lead to inefficiencies and hinder coordination even within the same forestry department in a locality. And since training is policy oriented, knowledge construction lacks systematization. Also, essential R&D outcomes do not trickle down to the lower administrative levels. The lower administrative level, the more expert, uh, expert knowledge thins out. And the lack of expertise undermines in turn the education and responsibilities of these uh, officials in the context of technical extension services provided to farmers. The whole problem of human capital development is further exacerbated by the obligation of rural authorities, which already lack highly skilled personnel, to absorb more low skilled workforce, including former soldiers and farmers. The little specialist training that is available at the lower levels of administration, especially at the township level, cannot compensate for the educational gap between urban and rural education in China. In chapter five, 
um, I dissect how the construction of ecological knowledge, uh, construct uh, the ecological knowledge construction develops along with the parameters of authoritative abstract ideas about sustainable development. And I unfold in detail the process of how training aims to influence the thought patterns of uh, officials in order to promote the value change within the bureaucracy. Forestry training has different objectives and depending on the type of training. So there are different types of trainings. We can go, you, uh, we can, I can go into detail if you'd like later. But forestry training is primarily geared toward policy implementation. Uh, training is organized according to predefined role expectations uh, that officials assume in, in the policy implementation process. And so they only learn what they need in these, uh, uh, according to their specific and predefined roles. Um, and in this sense, training does not only give directions of thinking, but also on action. Finally, in, uh, in the last chapter, uh, I, I look into uh, forestry exten uh, extension service. Um, China's decentralized government stru governance structure where forest tenure rights have been increasingly devolved to farmers, collectives and other private actors. Um, in this uh, decentralized government structure, the party state has a vital interest in shaping the thinking and action also of these act other actors. Uh, because it wants to make sure that they too operationalize development according to its vision. Uh, and it does so uh, through extension service. So the last chapter is therefore dedicated to this uh, extension service. And it shows how forestry carter training system connects, the forestry carter training system connects with this other system of knowledge construction and how the institutional connection uh, exacerbates other frictions and insufficiencies in extension service. I would like to add that the last chapter is not only a revised version of my last chapter in my dissertation, it is also in, uh, co authored with Jelena Gosseblei from Humboldt University. Uh, because when we met, met uh, in, in, uh, in Berlin back in 2019, we realized by coincidence that we had both done uh, work on a very specific topic that usually does not receive that much attention, draw that much attention uh, in the field of China studies. Uh, and so we decided to bring our findings together and, um, and this is why she's also uh, mentioned as co-author in the last chapter. Uh, quite unusual for a monograph, but uh, to put her only in a footnote would, uh, would be, uh, would have been unfair to her because she has put much, much work also in, in this, uh, in the extended version of, of, the, of, the, of the chapter and, um, and also her data. Um, and as a young scholar, she also needs uh, publications. So that's why I decided to do so. Um, yes, and with this, I would like to end my presentation and leave the rest of the time for discussions and questions. Um,